welcome to The Fitterist Show with your host, Christopher Allen, where we explore the art of mind and body conditioning. This week, we explore several current news stories in the health and wellness space. First up, we take a look at BMI, body mass index, and body fat percentage, the inherent pros and cons of each, and which is really a better measure of your overall health. Next, with video game playing surging during the pandemic, what is the impact of all those gaming hours on one's health and fitness? Finally, we examine a new study that posits that the remodeling of one's gut microbiome can inhibit the development of atherosclerosis. This foundational research could have a significant impact on potentially curbing high blood pressure and atherosclerosis in the future. So. Let's dive in. Our first story is about BMI, body mass index, versus body fat percentage. What's the right time to use which one? Now, we've talked about BMI back in episode 48 of the Fitter Show, where we highlighted some of the flaws in the BMI approach. While the approach is simplistic and does generally work in some areas, it has some non-trivial flaws. But let's take a rewind and look a little bit at the history of BMI. And to do that, we have to look at a Flemish statistician, Lambert Adolphe Jacques Coutelet. French isn't my first language, in case you were wondering. This guy gave us the concept of social averages. So he was really looking for what is the definition of an average man, average person, and wanted to find a distribution of body fat that would give him a just a bell-shaped curve. So again, rooted in mathematics, and he discovered way back in 1835 that a fairly accurate equation for the relationship of body mass to height was given by squaring the ratio of weight to height, and thus, essentially, the body mass index was born. Clearly, it wasn't called that at the time, but leave it up to a mathematician and a statistician to look for something that applies to a very large, large data set. So it's important to note that he wasn't a doctor. He was not really studying obesity or health. He was looking for a way to mathematically analyze populations. And so his index didn't really differentiate between fat and muscle or taking into account one's total body mass. So fast forward now to the 1970s, where a researcher named Ansel Keys conducted a study with more than 7,500 participants. And he was trying to find the most effective way to measure body fat. And he looked primarily at three different methods. The first was the body mass index calculation. The second was water displacement. And the third was skin calipers. And he determined that body mass index was probably the best, and here's the kicker, most cost-effective way to do so. So if you're going to go and do a water displacement test with a very large population that is not going to be cheap, and skin calipers, you're going to need experts to consistently measure skin fold measurements. Even this follow-up research was a little bit flawed, if you will, looking for a simplistic way to appeal to the masses. Nevertheless, in 1985, the National Institute of Health changed its definition of obesity to really include BMI, saying that it was indeed a simple measurement that is highly correlated with other estimates of fatness. That in and of itself, not untrue. Thus, BMI became an easy way to measure one's risk of obesity-related illnesses. So as we've discussed before, why is BMI not accurate? Well, just because BMI is a simple and very cost-effective way to measure, this doesn't mean that it's particularly accurate for everyone. This is partially true because things like muscle weighs more than fat. So if your body fat percentage is low, but you weigh more than what's average for your height, your BMI could say that you are obese or close to obese when you really are not. BMI is also just an indirect measure of body fat that doesn't take into account important details around age, sex, bone structure, muscle, fat distribution. It's just two numbers. It's just weight divided by height squared. It's simple, but probably not the most accurate. Just to give you an example, LeBron James, NBA superstar, is considered borderline obese when he is measured on the BMI scale. He's about 6'8", 
weighs about 250 pounds. You just do the math calculation. It comes out as almost borderline obese. Clearly, BMI has its flaws. And that brings us to body fat percentage. Now, this is shown to be an accurate indicator of the risk of osteoporosis with aging, high blood pressure, and other cardiometabolic risks, diseases, and increased mortality in general. All when people's BMIs or weight would indicate they are otherwise healthy. So body fat is simply a measure, not surprisingly, of the amount of fat in your body. Go figure. But body fat percentage doesn't still tell the entire story. Where the fat is stored in your body is important too. Some people carry fat around their midsection, the lower back. Others have more of an hourglass shape. Some people carry fat in their chest or their hips. So body fat distribution is determined in part by environmental factors, but also has a very strong genetic component. Also, body fat percentage really doesn't have anything to do with the amount of muscle mass that you have, which means you could have two people with the same amount of body fat percentage that look very, very different from one another. And body fat percentage also differs between men and women. So if you're looking for rough guidelines, there's kind of a chart that has men and women and then different categories, which I'll kind of recapture here. There's certainly an essential level of fat that the human body needs to live. And so for men, it's roughly 2 to 5%. For women, probably 9 to 12%. When you look at the next tier up, which is loosely categorized as athletes, in men, 6 to 13% body fat, women 14 to 20%. Fitness, generally people who are in shape, men 14 to 17%, women 20 to 25%. The again loosely coined term acceptable, men 18 to 25%, women 25 to 31%. And the final category is labeled as obese where men 26% plus women generally 32% plus. So there are a number of ways to test your body fat. We alluded to those a little earlier. Body fat calipers, I'm not going to go into detail on all of these, but body fat calipers, you measure the skin folds around different number of measurement points on the body. There is the measurement method with, you can have the old measuring tape. You can have a DEXA scan if you have a doctor or access to a DEXA scan machine. Or you can do the water tank or water displacement test. So there's different ways to measure your body fat. All of them have slightly different degrees of accuracy. So overall, look, BMI can be helpful if you're kind of above 20% body fat for men or 25% for women. Both your BMI and your body fat percentage will tell you that weight loss should be your primary goal. However, once you start to get more serious about your body weight, you start to get a little more active, you start to get into shape, you start training and drop down to where you have lower levels of body fat, then BMI becomes much less accurate indicator of health, and you should really rely more on body fat percentage. Hope that helps. Our next news story comes to us out of the University of New Hampshire which did a study and found that video games often stand in the way of exercise and healthy eating among male college students. They found that video games can be a risk factor for poor lifestyle habits that may contribute to overall poor health. Often habits developed in adolescence and early adulthood can stick with people for the rest of their lives. So if we have a population that has heavy video game usage in those formulative years, we may need to encourage those video game players to eat a little healthier and exercise more to help them live a little healthier without completely giving up video games. So the study was conducted on 1,000 male students age 18 to 24 at the University of New Hampshire, which is pretty convenient because you have a university with a bunch of 18 to 24 year old males. Anyway, the findings were scheduled for presentation at the American Society for Nutrition, so it has not fully been published in a peer-reviewed journal yet. But the way they conducted the study is they had participants report how much time they spent playing video games and what they ate. So again, self-reported data. Physical activity was recorded with a pedometer. So pretty simplistic study, but the results were interesting. 
more than 40% of the men that played video games for at least five hours a week. And those who played video games ate more saturated fat, more sodium than people who did not play video games, suggesting that they are probably eating more salty snacks. What a surprise, you say. Players also ate fewer fruits and vegetables and were less physically active than non-players. Although no huge differences were seen in weight between players and non-players, poor eating and exercise habits might lead to ex an excess of weight gain later in life. With video game usage rising sharply in general during the pandemic, increases in video game usage could translate to increases in overweight or obesity, poor eating habits, and longer term down the road, maybe chronic diseases in the general population, which is already a big issue. In addition, those 18 to 24 year old males, they're generally in better health than the general population at large. So this study is probably looking at a healthier subsection of people than the larger game playing population that are not as healthy as 18 to 20, most 18 to 24 year old males. So these increases extrapolated to the general population could be cause for concern. But the overall premise, people sitting on the couch playing video games, exercise less and might eat worse, not a huge surprise. In our final story, researchers at the Scripps Rance Institute have developed molecules that can remodel the bacterial population of the human gut and intestines to a healthier state. And they have shown, this is through experiments in mice, that this reduces cholesterol levels and strongly inhibits the thickened artery condition known as atherosclerosis. So this study was published in Nature Biotechnology. I'll provide a link to the detailed study for those who want to dive a little further at www.fitterist.com forward slash 066 for episode 66. But the scientists created a set of molecules called peptides that can slow the growth of less desirable species of gut bacteria. They're essentially cleaning up and improving the gut microbiome. In mice that develop high cholesterol and atherosclerosis from a high fat diet, these peptides beneficially shifted that balance of the gut microbiome and species, which are the bacteria that live inside the digestive system. The shift actually reduced cholesterol levels and dramatically slowed the buildup of fatty deposits in arteries, which are symptoms that are classic atherosclerosis. And just for definition, atherosclerosis is the condition that leads to heart attacks and strokes, which are the two leading causes of death among human beings. So even though this study was performed in mice, it is a big deal. The gut microbiome, which includes hundreds of different species of bacteria, evolved long ago as part of a fundamental symbiosis. The bacteria in the gut get a place to live and plenty to eat, and in return they assist by helping the host, in this case the human being, digest food. So these microbes, in part by their production of molecules called metabolites, not only help digest food, but play a role in metabolism, immunity, and some other important functions in the body. You've heard the gut is so key in health, immunity, and things like that. That's where it comes from. Scientists have also learned that this relationship can have a downside for the bacteria's human hosts. When people do things like overuse antibiotics or overeat diet that is rich in carbs and fats, sugar, processed foods, the gut microbiome actually change and can be altered in ways that promote disease. And it appears that the increased risk of obesity, diabetes, hypertension, high blood pressure, and atherosclerosis are due in part to the adverse changes in the microbiome that is generally fueled by a kind of Western diet, again, high in fats, high in carbs, high in sugar, processed foods. That recognition kind of led these researchers to look for ways to, wow, can we reprogram, remodel that microbiome with the goal of rolling back these adverse changes to restore good health to the gut microbiome? And the team had been working on a method that involves delivering small molecules to either kill or slow the growth of the bad gut bacteria without affecting 
the good gut bacteria. So the methodology of the study, they used mice that were genetically susceptible to high cholesterol, and they fed the animals a Western-type diet that swiftly and reliably produces, which is funny, a Western-type diet that swiftly and reliably produces high blood cholesterol and atherosclerosis, as well as adverse shifts in the gut microbiome. The researchers then, they took the animal's gut contents and applied a different cyclic peptide to each sample. And a day later, they sequenced the bacterial DNA in the samples to determine which peptides had shifted that gut bacteria in the desired directions. So through this process, a little bit of trial and error as they navigated their way through the testing process, the scientists identified two peptides that had significantly slowed the growth of undesirable gut bacteria, shifting the species balance closer to what is seen in mice that are fed a healthier diet. So using these peptides to treat atherosclerosis-prone mice that were eating this high-fat Western diet, they found big reductions in the animal's blood levels of cholesterol compared to untreated mice. This was about a 36% reduction in the cholesterol levels after two weeks of treatment. They also found that after 10 weeks, the plaque in the arteries of the treated mice were reduced by about 40% compared to those in untreated mice. So these cyclic peptides used in the study apparently interact with the outer membranes of the bacterial cells in a way that either slows or stops the cell's growth. Another interesting aspect is that these molecules, they also transit through the gut without entering the bloodstream. So in the study, the peptides were actually delivered to the mice in drinking water and weren't associated with any adverse side effects. Pretty impressive. So next steps. Clearly, this proof of principle demonstration, the researchers are now testing their peptides in mice that model diabetes, which is another common condition that has been linked to, again, an unhealthy gut microbiome. So this is research is both impressive in its effectiveness and also due to its potential impact on human health. With 40% of the United States essentially obese, including markers of diabetes, heart disease, and atherosclerosis, this research lays the foundation to help advance microbiome-targeted therapeutics down the road. So by being able to directly chemically manipulate that gut microbiome, Ongoing research may allow us to help reverse the development of several chronic diseases, including atherosclerosis, reducing plaque buildup in arteries in the human body through peptides. Man, pretty impressive. Never underestimate science. We'll talk to you next week. With that, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to listen to The Fitterist Show. You can follow us on Instagram at FitteristMindBody and on Twitter at FitteristMindBody.